everybody, and welcome to this week's WW Newscast. I am Lou Mangello, author of the Walt Disney World Trivia Books, host of the WW Radio Show, and publisher of Celebrations Magazine. Today is December 8th, 2010. Be sure and join us every Wednesday at 7.30 Eastern for the WW Newscast, which is going to be a live, interactive news show covering the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando, Florida. You can be a part of the broadcast and the discussion and talk about the news real-time in the chat window. If you can't make it, you can watch the entire show on YouTube, on the WW Radio YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash WW Radio. There you can continue the conversation by commenting on the video. I'll be sure and watch it and do the same. You can also get notified of breaking news and unscheduled shows by following me on Twitter. I'm twitter.com slash Lumangelo and joining the Facebook page at facebook.com slash WW Radio. Let's get right into the news. Again, a quiet week of news this week. Not a lot of breaking news, but I do want to go first and talk about the fact that... Wanted to mention that between December 19th and January 3rd at Disneyland, and between December 19th and January 1st at Walt Disney World, you can now redeem a voucher, much like this one, and save 30% with the purchase of any entree at select restaurants. You must note that you need to dine before noon or between 3 and 4.30 and alcohol is not included. Now I thought this was very interesting that they're bringing out these vouchers once again. They did do this last year. Uh, I'm wondering if this is telling us that are people coming to the parks and not buying food? More importantly, are they bringing their own food to the parks? And I want to ask you guys who are watching either on YouTube or live in the chat room to save money uh, because food can get expensive, especially if you're with a large family. Have you ever taken food into the parks? You ever bring food in with you? I talk to some people I know that work at Walt Disney World and say, yeah, with the down economy, people are still visiting Walt Disney World, but they're coming in with bags and leaving without them, which means that they're bringing in food and not leaving with merchandise. A lot of people are saying, that they don't bring in food. Uh, a couple have, I guess, obviously, again, to save money. For me, obviously, if you listen to the show, you know dining is a very big part of the Walt Disney World and the entire Disney experience, especially because of the variety of the wonderful restaurants and dining options that are there. Uh, some people are saying that they do bring in snacks, not meals. A lot of people do bring in water. Um, a big tip people do in order to save money is if you have a refrigerator in your room, you either freeze or refrigerate bottles of water. If, you, if you're driving down, you pick up a case of water inexpensively, 4 or $5, put the water in there, and then throw it in your backpack. If you can freeze it, especially in the summer, another great way to save money. But I think a lot of people are saying that it's just water and snacks not really doing for the full meal. Uh, in order to find the voucher for 30%, it is on the official Disney Parks blog. I will link to it in the uh, notes section in the YouTube video, which I'll post up later on tonight. Um, speaking of food, the Taqueria del Lago, which was the temporary Mexican counter service restaurant, is closed and has been removed from the World Showcase Promenade. If you've been on World Showcase, you may have remembered, it opened back in December 2009. It served counter service food um, during the refurbishment of La, Can La Cantina de San Angel. It's been open for the past couple of months now this area is just empty and being used for stroller parking. So my question to you is, this very much was like a food and wine festival kiosk. Do you like the idea of having some of these very quick service kiosks around the World Showcase Promenade? There is one in Mexico for margaritas. There's one in China for tea. Uh, one in Germany for beer and soda and pretzels. Do you like having these sort of options, a quick sort of grab and go, where maybe you don't have to get online? at a full counter service restaurant. Everybody seems to be saying yes. Oh, Tisney said, very handy option for a, a quick snack. Um, Henry is saying it's cool to have food and wine kiosks all year long. I thought the same thing, being a foodie that I am, but I wonder, does that maybe detract from food and wine? Would that not give a people a reason to come back? But what if each pavilion, permanent pavilion that's there had a quick service kiosk Right on the promenade, you can walk by, grab something, keep going on your way without potentially having to going uh, actually into the pavilion proper. Um, what would that do to crowd flow, says Abel VOO2. 
good point. Um, right now, there are a bunch of them scattered. It never really seemed to be too much of an issue with the Mexico one out there. Again, I wondered if we had 11 or so of those scattered around World Showcase, how that would be. I'd love, again, for you guys to continue commenting uh, here on the YouTube channel in the comment section below if you like the idea, maybe what kind of kiosks or what kind of food items you'd like to see. A uh, quick trip over to Pleasure Island. There are new uh, perimeter construction walls over at the Rock and Roll Beach Club. That closed back in February 2008. Now with the recent announcement of Hyperion Wharf, it looks like this may be the first building to be demolished as part of the new Hyperion Wharf. Um, I have very fond memories and not so fond memories of the Beach Club going back. And I started thinking about as the landscape of Pleasure Island starts to change, what was your favorite part of the original Pleasure Island that now is going to be gone? What maybe would you like to see come back? And I know a lot of people are going to immediately say the Adventures Club. There's definitely a nostalgic uh, connection to that. But a lot of people have written to me when I talked about Hyperion Wharf and said they missed things like the Comedy Warehouse. Uh, I miss the Fireworks Factory, which was where Motion used to be. So I'm curious if you could maybe keep one of those things or resurrect one of those things, or what are you going to miss most about the uh, the original Pleasure Island? Florida Mingo, like me, loved 8-tracks. I also liked Mannequins as well. Um, the rotating dance floor and everything else that was going on was a great experience. Um, Stinky Pete misses the big Jessica Rabbit sign. Bunch of people, Mannequins and Comedy Warehouse. Again, Comedy Warehouse was one of those experiences unique to Walt Disney World. Uh, much like the Adventures Club, things that people really enjoyed. Again, please continue to comment here in uh, on the YouTube channel. Coming next year, as part of the 2011 Epcot International Flower and Garden Festival, Woody and Buzz Lightyear are going to meet their arch enemy, Lotso the Teddy Bear, not so cuddly teddy bear, on the Future World Playground for the 18th Epcot International Food and Wa I'm sorry, Flower and Garden Festival. March 2nd through May 15th, 2011. This is going to mark the first time that Disney Pixar characters are going to be used as the welcoming area of the topiaries uh, in Future World. There's going to be a sand castle, a strawberry scented field, and playground toys. The first time, not only have they been featured at the festival, but the first time in seven years that the front entrance floral spectacle showcases all new topiary characters. Remember, a lot of times it's been Mickey and Minnie and the Fab Five. In World Showcase, there's going to be a giant new Cars 2 display and getting ready for the film which is coming out next year. Winnie the Pooh, Tigger, and their friends are going to appear also as topiaries in a 100-acre wood wildflower display located between Future World and World Showcase. Again, getting ready for the Winnie the Pooh movie which is going to debut in summer 2011. There's going to be an expanded Bambi Butterfly House with a new healthy living garden, and Rapunzel is also going to be there, as she's going to have Rapunzel's tower in the Tangled Magical Garden, inspired obviously by the recent film. That's going to be located between Germany and Italy. There's going to be new to the festival acts at the Flower Power concert series, including Melissa, Don't Cry Out Loud, Manchester, Marilyn McCoo and Billy Javis Jr. You don't have to be a star. And Juice, I'm playing with the Queen of Hearts, Newton. It was going to run between March 25th through April 17th. For more information about the festival, you can visit uh, DisneyWorld.com slash flower or call 407-W-Disney. My question to you is you see, again, there is a shift to a certain degree where they're bringing a lot more characters in, a lot more synergy with events and new films. Do you like that? Do you like the idea that the Flower and Garden and some of these other, other festivals and events are being tied so closely to upcoming or recent releases or even DVD releases? Do you like them sort of promoting the new films or do you like having the classic characters? A lot of people in chat, Amy Falk Peterman loves it. WF Genius says yes. Kenobi fan loves it. So a little less, somebody says a little less, a little yes, a little no, but for the most part, uh, they're saying, I love it. It adds charm with a splash of Disney, says Becky. They should use new and old, says Mickey Waffle. I like it. My kids will, too. And I think that is a big part of it. I think Flower and Garden, for the most part, definitely attracts adults. This is something that now kids have a chance to go around and search for, 
much as they do hidden Mickeys, now they're searching for new characters. Now they're going to be drawn into World Showcase to find the Cars 2 topiaries and that whole area back there. So a lot of, Amy Falk Peter again says kids are going to love it. Um, they like the idea of new items and new characters. Again, we've had this Disney slash Pixar debate and that line being blurred. We wonder, uh, some people in the chat are wondering when that's going to start to include Marvel characters. I wonder how that would play in World Showcase during Flower and Garden Festival. Um, Crisby2000 says it's hard to make flowers appealing to boys. That too is interesting. We're talking about things like Bambi's Butterfly House and Winnie the Pooh, but you also have cars. And in the past, like last year, we had uh, Peter Pan and Captain Hook, great topiaries. There's also things from The Lion King. So they mix the original classic Disney, that Golden Age Renaissance Disney, and now we're seeing this next generation with Tangled, Cars 2, the Disney Pixar films. And again, I'm curious to see, and anybody who's in here, uh, is this something that maybe you didn't bring your kids to in the past that now maybe you'd feel more comfortable bringing them to in the future, uh, next year, when it comes to um, Epcot. Uh, some people saying, I agree, no Marvel in the parks. Um, Jimmy Kenny would like to see some Star Wars topiaries. But a lot of people, yeah, it seems to be that everybody is in agreement that they like the idea, and maybe it sort of freshens up the Flower and Garden Festival by having these new characters, the Pixar characters, and the new, even unreleased films as yet. Again, I would love for you all to continue this conversation in the comments section below. Um, last thing, I want to just throw out one quick rumor. I've gotten a lot of emails about this over the past few weeks. I did mention it a couple of weeks ago on one of the first newscasts. Over at Disney's Hollywood Studios, for a very, very long time, it's been rumored that there's going to be a new Monsters, Inc. attraction coming right next to Toy Story Midway Mania. If you're looking at Toy Story Midway Mania, the hot set to the left is reportedly going to be the location of a Monsters, Inc. attraction. But we've also heard rumors of a potential Tron attraction in development. Now, I'd heard that the Monsters, Inc. was greenlit, but it was put on hold because, number one, Tron may go in that spot, and number two, Toy Story Midway Mania is so incredibly popular, why are you going to put a second Gatebuster attraction right next to what arguably is still the most popular attraction in Walt Disney World. So my question to you, and I want to leave you with this in the chat room and in the comments, is which of the two would you like to see? Would you like to see a Monsters, Inc. attraction, again, sort of old school, relatively speaking, Pixar, or a Tron Legacy attraction for an as yet unreleased and obviously unproven film? If neither... What would you like to see there? We're seeing a lot of Monsters, Inc. and Tron going back and forth, so it's obviously very much a split already in the chat room. If you don't want to see either of those two, answer me this. Would you like to see an attraction based on a classic film or something based on the new film? Do you think the classics still hold up and are relevant enough for a new attraction? And would you like to see a thrill ride attraction, like a roller coaster, like Rock and Roller Coaster or Tower of Terror, or maybe something for the entire family, going back to Walt's idea that he wanted something that his daughters and their grandmother could all ride. Again, maybe something like Toy Story Midway Mania. Simple dark ride for the kids, a Monsters Inc. coaster, more thrills, says Dragon Ally. Um, an Aladdin show like Disneyland, do you want more shows over at Disney's Hollywood Studios? Um, based on entire family, a Tron light cycle ride, Rick, New Jersey, one of many people hoping for some sort of Tron simulator, kind of getting on the game grid, riding a light cycle, maybe even playing Discs of Tron. Um, certainly if the film does well, that could be a great option for Disney's Hollywood Studios. Again, I want to leave you with that. I want to leave you with those questions. I'd love for you to continue to comment here on the YouTube channel. A couple of quick announcements before I leave. Don't forget, voting goes for one more week over at podcastawards.com. Please vote for WW Radio both in the best travel and best produced categories. Make sure you use a valid email address because you will get an email in order to verify your vote. And I thank you again all for your friendship and your support. Also, don't forget, if you want to join the WW Radio running team and be part of the Walt Disney World Marathon, either as a runner or to cheer on the runners, you can visit the WW Radio blog. I'll also link to that in this notes section over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash WW Radio. Don't forget to visit the website at www.radio.com for 
blogs are friendly discussion forums, photos, videos. There you can also order signed copies of my Walt Disney World trivia books, my audio guides on CD, the free WW Radio iPhone app. You can link to that there. You can also order Celebrations Magazine. If you want to comment on this show or on the podcast, feel free to call the voicemail toll free at 888-703-2171. I'll play it on the air. And um, that is going to do it for this week's show. Again, thank you so much for taking the time and tuning in this and every week, whether you're watching us live in the chat room or watching us on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. I am Lou Mangello from WW Radio. Thanks so much for watching. See ya. W. W. Radio. Your